Okay, I'm seeing everyone filter in. Thank you so much for joining us and taking time out of your day to tune in to the Indiana Arts Homecoming. I hope that you were able to see our awesome keynote session this morning with Americans for the Arts and that you're catching all the breakout sessions that your heart could desire. During this session, we are going to be talking about diversity. Um, we often hear that, well, we're not a very diverse community, meaning the community doesn't have a lot of ethnic or racial diversity. And we would like to reach out to new audience, but we're not sure how to start. If either of those statements feels like something that's popped into your head, then this session is right for you. We're gonna to discuss today why community engagement is so important, and you'll leave with some valuable tips and tricks. Um, before we get started, I'd like to just uh, let you guys know that we do have American Sign Language interpreters with us today. So if that's a service that you would like to utilize, please know that they are available. Their names are Angela and Martha, or Marla, excuse me. Um, if you are not speaking, I'd ask that you uh, turn off your video and your microphone. That way everyone can see the American Sign Language interpreters should they need them. They won't get lost that way. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Um, if you have any questions or comments about what the speakers are talking about, you are more than welcome to enter those in the chat box and they will be keeping an eye on them as will myself. And we will get to those comments and questions um, at the earliest convenience. That's all I have to kick us off. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it on over to Paige, Anna, and Palermo. Take it away, you guys. Great. Thank you, Bridget. I'm excited to have so many people join us uh, today. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm with the Indiana Arts Commission. I'm the Deputy Director of Programs. Uh, I've been with the IAC for a while and been in the arts administrator world for a bajillion years. Um, join me is Palermo. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Um, I'm the community liaison for the city of Fort Wayne and um, I've had work in the past uh, 11 years for the city, uh, just building bridges uh, throughout the communities uh, in, in Fort Wayne and actually um, the county and, and the region. So it's my pleasure to, to share some of the things that I have learned uh, of all these years and uh, I'm looking forward to an engaging uh, uh, workshop. Great, thank you, Palermo. Anna? Hi, I'm Anna Tragesser. I'm the Artist and Community Services Manager at the Indiana Arts Commission. Um, I get to work with Paige and all of our colleagues all the time. I'm currently in the office I'm in Indianapolis and that's where I usually am living in Indianapolis. Great, thank you. And those of you that have joined, please let us know who you are in the chat box. Uh, I'd love to know your, what county you're from and your uh, art form, either your favorite or your organizations or what you do as an artist would be great to know. And certainly as we have these uh, conversations and stories, please throw in your questions. We are here to help you as you forge into this territory or maybe um, re-engage with it in, in whatever way that you want to. What I threw into the chat box is what, what is effectively called a meeting agreement. And meeting agreements are very commonly used and they may be very common to you already, but if you've never used it before, it's a really helpful way um, to have a conversation where all voices are welcome and respected and heard. Um, so it's this active listening, um, use I statements um, because you're not there to speak for others, just for yourself, and to lean the dis discomfort, things of that nature. So it's a good strategy to use, particularly when we think about working in community engagement. So in working with Anna and Palermo in preparing for this session, we wanted to get on the same page um, right off the bat about diversity. So what is diversity? What is diversity at your organization? Or what about your community? So just go ahead and uh, throw in the chat box what you view as diversity. Um, so maybe you can introduce yourself, your favorite art form, and what you think diversity is. Palermo, how do you define diversity? Well, diversity, it's so broad and, and there's so many layers on that, but I think it's, um, uh, an important way to really look into uh, um, a human being and look it in, into the um, 
contributions they can uh, provide and and, uh, and to our community. I think that's the the best way to that I describe as the diversity. You know, uh, and it's it's an empowering way to uh, reach out to many people in in uh, cinema. As, um, as someone that you you're working along with, and uh, I, I think that's what has helped me out to really uh, work with so many people in the community. Yeah, yeah. Anna? Um, yeah, my gosh. I mean, usually in my everyday life, I, I even have, I don't know what this says. Eh, this is helpful. I have this little handy post-it note, um, even on my screen, to remind myself to consider several different types of things whenever there are things that are real, like whenever I'm working on programs that I need to make sure um, being as inclusive as possible. So the things that are on my list right now, which doesn't cover everything in the world, certainly, but in my everyday life, most of the time, it means differences in age, differences in gender diversity, in gender identity, differences in where we live and the types of um, landscape or physical communities we live in, um, what race we are, what ability, physical or mental ability we have, and what kind of creative work, creative medium we work in. Yeah, and one thing that um, Palermo brought up one time was like, just your family history um, can bring diversity. And it also in thinking about from a community perspective, certain areas of Indiana have um, a lot of Quaker or a lot of German, like in Southern Indiana. Um, so when we talk about diversity, it's a matter of, it's, it's a pretty, the broad sort of um, definition of all the difference, all the ways in which we differ. But oftentimes, um, we hear a lot from rural Indiana or in parts of the state where there's not a lot of racial diversity. Um, maybe there's maybe 2% um, of, of what demographically is represented with the racial diversity. But there are so many people that aren't being included. And I think you'll notice that in your programs and services, who's not coming. And oftentimes the people who are not coming are the ones that are simply not at the table or are not being included in terms of the process or bringing things together. So I wanted to kind of start off with that, that sort of point of positioning uh, before we move forward. So Palermo, you work with a lot of different communities in your experience with Fort Wayne and working with the city. What would tips um, that you would provide the folks today for engaging with new audiences, particularly ones from different racial backgrounds? Yes, um, uh, I'll just uh, tell you a little story about how I, I started. Um, I moved to um, Fort Wayne uh, about 25 years ago, and uh, there was hardly anyone that you know looked like me, and um, it was uh, actually really exciting to see someone or hear someone that spoke the language, you know, and uh, you will just get excited, look, look for them at the mall, and then just uh, start talking to them and asking where they're from. And so, um, 25 years later, now we have a growing uh, population of the Hispanic community. We have about, according to the Pew Research, about 426,000 Latinos in, 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 in Indiana and about close to about 8%. And um, I'm excited to uh, see the census um, that's coming out in the, at the end of the year. So um, I also like to encourage people we have, we're working really hard on, on getting people involved in the census and uh, providing that information because that is useful to all agencies throughout the, the state. And um, what I've done in, in the past was just really look into the contributions of the people, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, just really uh, looking at them as um, someone that I could learn about and I could, um, you know, have a, a, a good friendship and, you know, a, 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 a working relationship as well. And, uh, I uh, will say that uh, when I first started was, you know, really working with the Hispanic community, even though I spoke Spanish, there was um, a lot of people from the no northern part of, of Mexico, which is not um, the same as where I, I was from, you know, from the central part of Mexico. So foods, uh, music, um, some of the, the language utilized is different. So I had to adapt to, through it and then build a relationship with the community members. So that was one, um, you know, learning about what, where they're from, 
listening to them and really uh, paying attention to those uh, those um, distinctive items that, that they are. So I can tell you now, 25 years later, it's been a f fantastic um, group of people that I, I, I continue to work with. And um, one of the things that I like to uh, mention is that how um, they are looking into um, not just going to the same person uh, all the time. And so I'm not an expert, but actually I can provide information. And, and I always tell people, you know, this is something uh, ongoing uh, relationship building with, with the community members. So that's one of the tips. Um, you, you add value to and contributions from, uh, from the, the communities as well. Thanks, Palermo. Um, one of the other things that we um, want to kind of position some of this conversation on is why is it important to talk about engaging diverse and new audiences? Um, and that can certainly mean different things for everyone. Um, so throw it in the chat box if you would. Why are you in this session and why are you why is that important to you, engaging new and diverse audiences? Um, for me, I think Palermo, you just hit on one of the big things for me is that um, if we're looking at the future of our state and of our nation, um, the non-white communities and communities who are not traditionally Anglo or um, upper middle class are not the growing demographics in our, in our area. And so if we're thinking about being a financially solvent and relevant organization, or even um, as an artist, someone who's interested in really paying attention to what's happening in the world, that's the reality in front of us. Even if it doesn't quite look like it yet in our community, that's a big one. Um, and we talk about, I talk with community leaders all the time about attracting and retaining a strong workforce. Um, that's a big one for people who are looking for a high quality place to live is finding a place that's really inclusive and, and encounters many different perspectives and, and uh, experiences within their home community. Uh, why is it for you, Paige? And keep throwing those things in the chat box, y'all. Why are you, why does this matter to you? Um, that's a, I think about, I've been thinking about this for years, I, I love working in this landscape. Um, first, I feel like it, it's more people to play with, more people um, to bring in. The, the idea when I was first working in the museum industry was how elitist museums are and how non-inclusive they are. And that continuing in that mode, the institution would eventually die. So it was about also becoming really relevant to the community. Why is it, why is your organization important? Why would the community want to support it? Um, and the less relevant it is to the community, um, the less likely it is to be sustainable. Um, so part of it is also finding resources and ways to celebrate um, the things that are out there that you're not aware of and to bridge barriers within a community where the art can start to play more of a central role beyond just showing images, but being a catalyst for larger conversations like poverty or health issues or um, racial equity can be, they can be um, the proponent for those conversations to get started. And that's really exciting to me because I think the arts are such a fundamental part of who we are as humans. Yes, and I think about building relationships, you know, you start really listening to the community. It's not like really uh, throwing, you know, everything that you got or something, you know, that you have the latest uh, program or uh, activity, but actually meeting with one-on-one uh, -on -one with people, I think that's a more um, important at the beginning because uh, that's how you're gonna start building relationships. And if you just either send emails or just uh, call people on the phone, they're not going to really answer to your, uh, you know, um, questions or, or uh, your outreach. So it's, it's basically getting out, getting out of the office and really uh, walking in, uh, along with people. Um, unfortunately, we have the pandemic going, so it's, <laughs> it's a little difficult uh, right now. But I think it's still, you can do research about your community. That's very important. Be genuinely uh, involved in the community and reaching out to, to them. Um, you know, there's a, a, a big population here in Fort Wayne of, of Burmese uh, community members uh, uh, 
they have ref we have refugees that uh, have been established you know at least for 10 15 years already so it's it's important to to reach out to um the 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 community members that started first and then they will start to um introduce you to more people in the community and that's what i did um you know it was just really um by one and and meeting one person and then going to an event and you know going to this of course uh, uh loving the food because it's so tasty you know? <laughs> all countries and and it was just a fantastic way to really um get to know the person and eventually then you you'll have once you establish that relationship um you you can uh, provide that information but don't assume that you are you know you know everything or you can bring the best program and um, that's had happened in the past you know with the health fairs or any type of educational fairs that you know people don't buy in they're not going to show up you know mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about um you know child care have you thought about transportation have you thought about the day of of of, of the day of the week and the time it could be prayer time it could be uh, you know, family time as well, you know, so there's so many things that you got to start to look into and figuring out and the best way to do it is asking questions uh, for people in the community. Yeah, gosh, that's, that's so valuable. I, I was cracking up because somebody in the feed said, so if we feed them, they will come. <laughs> Uh, with high schoolers, right? Those of us who work with youth, absolutely. <laughs> I got pizza, man. Remember when you did all those pizza parties? <laughs> the grant writing pizza party. Uh, yeah, that's right. I did do that. But it's certainly humanities even has that chew on this, right? That really brings people to the table. Mm. One of the things I want to ask, if it's okay, um, going a little off script here, but Palermo, one of the things that um, you brought up when we were kind of discussing before today, um, this idea that, you know, it's, some of us are, are a little bit ways in in this work. I still feel like I'm in the one-on-one -on -one, in the one -on -one, -on one version of this class, right? Like this in new, engaging new audiences, which is, I think, why um, this is an important conversation that we know we're at different levels in this and even the beginning level, we should hear from each other and like know, like find solidarity and feel like, um, oh, well, here's, here's what I learned and here's, here's the mistakes I made. Um, and one of those things that I appreciate that you brought up, Palermo, is that um, sometimes there can be, you know, gatekeepers in a community. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a community I want to engage. Um, maybe I, I want to start understanding um, how to work with artists who are blind or have visual impairments. Um, I know maybe I know one person or maybe I know an organization that uh, works with a lot of blind folks or visually impaired folks. Um, but that person might also that that might not be quite enough because that could be that could be another barrier or filter where they do not, may not necessarily know or have connections to maybe everyone that I could should keep challenging myself. Am I getting that right, Palermo, or will you talk more about that idea? Um, yes, I, I think it's it's and that's how you get you get to know the people. You know, um, uh, we usually have this we reach out to the people that we feel most comfortable with because you know there is that relationship but there's a lot more people out there that don't receive the information as Paige mentioned you know this this will definitely uh, you know open your eyes and say you know um, let me look at and in, into a different community and establish that relationship um, and it's again it's not going to be really f a fast way to do it because um, you know, uh, again, either through email or phone calls, you really have to get out and, and get out, get it with the people in the community. Uh, you know, I mean, for when we have so many uh, diverse community members, we have uh, Congolese, we have, um, uh, you know, of course, Burmese and Vietnamese, Korean, and all this uh, people have uh, been established throughout the, the, the years here in Fort Wayne, about 30 some years with the uh, Catholic charities as a, a agency that resettles the, the, the community members. So anyway, so by actually uh, making that connection with Catholic Charities and going through different um, um, events, that's how you get to know a lot of the people. And, and so it's not just one person anymore, but actually now you have a direct contact with that community itself. 
it's not uh, someone that you know like myself some people ask me it's like well can you take me to this place or can you tell me about the Burmese well I'm going to tell you what I know about it but I want you to go and meet the person that I, I, I'm going to connect you with because uh, no way a um, representative of that community you know and um, and if you're actually genuinely interested in the community want you to go to those events that are they're having, you know, um, well, they will have eventually again. And, and those are the ways that you will establish those relationships. And then your, your uh, network will open up, you know, tremendously. And that, that's a, a good way to, you know, maintain those relationships. And as Paige seen, you know, once you make that connection, you have friends for many years. I mean, I get invited to go to Burma, I get invited to go to India and all those places. I just need the money for it, you know, to travel. <laughs> because, you know, you have, you know, I've been invited to weddings in other countries, you know, just, just the people are so proud of their countries that they want to showcase. And then mm -hmm. once you have those um, relationships, again, uh, you are part of a, 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 a a family, you know, a, a culture that embraces um, someone that is really out to to help and, and collaborate. Yeah. So there's a wonderful comment in here. Thank you for all of that, Palermo. And it reminds me of when we worked on a program together and she's, she's talking about um, it was difficult to grow diversity in the organization related to programs. Um, and she had recently attended some writing conferences and noticed the same issue. Attendees were mainly middle-aged white females, likely middle-class. And, you know, there's this real interest in broadening, you know, that, that audience out. So it doesn't all look monochromatic. So when, I met Palermo and we have become lifelong friends because of working in wanting to engage in a new audience and God knows I didn't do it perfectly right but one of the things that that I did was I said you know I had a gallery to curate and it's education gallery and so why not educate the community about itself about folks that they're not familiar with bridge barriers right and particularly working with Latino Hispanic community so I asked colleagues who should I talk to and they're like you gotta talk to Palermo and I was like oh okay cool so I got together with Palermo and we're like who else do I need to talk to oh you need to talk to this person this person this person and like he suggested I just started meeting with everybody um, and we had like a focus group. We brought people to the table. You know, what are you interested in? Do you, would, would Day of the Dead be of interest? Because I had seen that done at the past museum. And lots of people were really interested in that. But the thing was that we would go out and talk to them. We wouldn't make them come to us. Um, of course, Palermo knew like everybody in the city anyway. And there's something that to think about in working in this landscape. And that is power. Um, we have, a, a, if you're working in an organization, you have a lot of power. You have the power to control the narrative, to control what's on the walls, to, you know, who's included. Um, and the most important part to me with community engagement is sharing that. Last year, we had a session called Don't Call Me Just Because It's February. Um, and it, and it, that's important to be mindful of. It's not just this one time of year thing. It's relationships over time. So people feel included all year round. For Palermo and I, we brought all these groups together and we had conversations with them and we shared the power so that they had ownership of certain elements. Like um, the guy we couldn't remember the name of besides his nickname, Kiko, who was a Peruvian who built the ofrenda um, and represented his organization in the gallery. Um, and then people recommending, oh, when we do the, the family day, we should have bilingual people at the door welcoming everyone so they can welcome different languages or um, having all the materials translated and getting funds for that. So the people were really, they had power too. It, we had this trust that was built through these conversations. What was really interesting to me, Palermo, is that I remember I presented about Dia de los Muertos um, 
to the Latino Hispanic community. And Max, uh, he who you had also introduced me to, um, he translated. And I realized that, you know, coming over to a, being an immigrant, you can lose your family and cultural history and understanding. I certainly have. I guess I have an English background. I barely know that. But so it was interesting that there was like this broader understanding was brought um, to, to everybody. It was really, it was really great. And then that program had a tremendous number of individuals that came in from the Latino Hispanic community. And it's just continued to grow over time, you know, from two or 300 people, what that first year to what was the most recent one that they did. Oh, it's, it, I, I can't remember it's, it's, it's every year it breaks record at, uh, for the count for the Fort Wayne Museum of Art and thanks to you Paige and it's been about I guess 16 years uh, that this um, Dia de los Muertos has um, you know continued and because it was that the relationship that you really had with for the community and um, in and I, myself, I really enjoy to showcase at the at the Museum of Art, you know, about my culture and and, and being in, inclusive, and also invite people in the community to contribute. It was not just about what I thought about it. It's actually a collective um, collaboration of people and and providing info. So we started with one ofrenda. Now we have at least 12 or so uh, friends in the, in, in the Museum of Art. And I think we have um, taken one of the galleries uh, that uh, had a lot of friends. And it's, it's uh, such uh, an accomplishment. And, and I'm grateful that uh, the museum continues to be open to, to collaborate with the community and, and having that call out to those uh, people in the community. Uh, as you mentioned, yes, the, the the application is either in Spanish, it's in Spanish and English as well. So um, this has reached out to uh, Spanish uh, um, teachers, you know, people out in the community out, actually not just in Fort Wayne now, people come from different um, areas around the county and the region to look into the, those um, exhibits. So it's been a fantastic job. And I wanna say thank you again for that initial uh, taking the initiative to to really establish that and and as you mentioned yes we have been friends since then on you know it was it's been a fantastic journey yeah it's it's fun it's really fun but he you know it's interesting Palermo we talk about this and Fort Wayne is a large community right and there's a lot of really small communities in the state um and one of our friends who's online watching us present right now is like well you know, in terms of this really small community, this is who we are, which mostly white middle aged. You know, but this is, you know, so how do we work in this in this landscape? Um, Anna, do you have any suggestions? I'm happy to provide some suggestions, but I feel like I talk too much. So, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I have a lot more I want to share about um, how we could do this, but even just like really quickly. I wonder maybe what it might be like to imagine this as kind of a, a little exploration, a little bit of a scavenger hunt a little bit. Um, one of my favorite things to do is, well, I get to work with a lot of communities from around the state um, at all different sizes. And they, oh my gosh, I love walking around the downtown areas. People are so proud of their communities. And my hat is what, like, where's the creativity happening? And that's not just the, um, the lucky artist that has a studio in the downtown area or, or the, the pavilion or the amphitheater that your um, community bands get to perform at. But I get really excited when I find the sign painters who are doing work in the windows. That's a generational thing that your, your community has been created for a long time. Or the highly specialized tinkerers who are working on um, maybe antiques or restoring, uh, restoring items like that. Um, you know, so go with me on this analogy a little bit. There are people who say Indiana is not creative or that there's not a lot of artists in Indiana, but those adventures 
prove that assumption wrong all the time, right? We just have to look at maybe change the way we, we are thinking about it a little bit differently. I'm not, not looking for a concert hall in those situations. Um, but there are seeds there to grow. And so I wonder maybe if there's a way that we can map that onto this diversity question. Um, and if we're thinking about especially people of color in Indiana, um, yeah, that, that gets a little bit trickier because the demographics have told us, at least in the, the most recent data available, that a lot of Indiana is quite white, especially in smaller communities. Um, but we all have different heritages and we all have our own well-worn paths of going about the world. Um, and so even if it might be that um, in a very rural place, there could be um, an employer somewhere in the area that is employing immigrants in a really exciting way that that we know that's a growing population in Indiana. It may not be in your downtown area, maybe out in the county a little bit more. Um, and I think there's also something to be said for like, we know that those numbers may be small sometimes, um, but they are worth, and you know this, this is why you're here in this session, they're worth looking for and building trust with, um, because we know those numbers will continue to grow in the future, as our demographers are telling us. Um, and this is a great time to start building relationships and start um, creating new pathways for people to feel comfortable no matter where they are in your community. I don't know your community exactly well, like, like you know it, but I don't know, there's an idea, something I've been um, rolling around in my brain for a little while. I love that, uh, definitely, Anna, thank you for sharing. And, and it is a, a good opportunity to really um, bring power to the community as uh, you're engaging with someone. And uh, again, you know, it might not be someone from the same area, but close enough to to share some of their, the, their mm. skills, some of the arts, you know, some of the, 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 the you know, uh, things that they, they can provide. And I think that's just, just really getting out of the box and, and looking into uh, other areas. So, um, um, you know, we continue to grow in Indiana and, and definitely this uh, is not gonna change. So uh, I think, you know, preparing, you know, looking into your own uh, agency and, and, and do a strategic planning about how we're gonna, uh, you know, create this atmosphere that is welcoming, that is uh, inclusive, that collaborates with the, the newcomers in the, in, the, in the city, in the community or, or the area, even though it's rural, you know, how do, how do we provide those opportunities for everyone? So because, again, it's a powerful way to tell people that you are a, a place of, that welcomes and um, it's eager to, to grow and provide um, so many things and comforts for the communities. And, uh, you know, once you start with those uh, relationship buildings, then you will see how communities respond um, to, to um, actions that, you know, are very genuine. Yeah, that's so true. You know, there's a comment in here and um, about working with economically challenged people who may have no connection to resources or media. So how do we how do we connect with them? And it was really great that talking to an organization in Muncie recently, and they had heard about uh, you know, there's a high need for food because people, um, the, the food bank has just been slammed. There's also a high need for kids to have things to do. Um, so they created these art kits and they worked with the food bank um, to, so that the families could have art kits and the, they were thrilled. So it's an existing mechanism was this food bank. It could be a library. It could be a boys and girls club in your community. So sometimes it's about reaching out and building those bridges and those relationships that you're going to have to do something a little bit differently than you have before. And that's great. That is what this work is all about. And it's, it's building those, those new connections and it's expanding out and it's going to where they are. And it's making that extra effort or that different effort, maybe not even next extra. It's just different than what you've done in the past. 
I can share more about how we've done that page at the Indiana Arts Commission. Sure, that'd be Look great. Us. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Alice um, in the comments. If you out there also have other ideas of what that like little adventure has looked like for you when you're switching up how you're doing things to be able to encounter um, new people, if that's your if that's your aim, would love to hear it. Or if there's a, something else, different way you would describe that or other suggestions, please start in the chat box. Um, so, and I also, I think I want to acknowledge like the, in a very small community where it's very, if you've identified what kind of diversity you, you want to build relationships with or want to see more inclusion of in, in anything, if that's, you know, in, in communities that are very small and if your population of people of color is very small, you may not be, you may not be ready for like the Fort Wayne Museum of Art who's, who's doing this huge Dia de los Muertos event every year. That's not realistic, is it? It is a slow, long race with what we call the three pound weight tone with a three pound weight, not a 100 pound weight, right? Um, and just maybe just that like asset mapping or discovering process is what's ahead for your community. This is a long term process and it's important for you to pace yourself because you're taking it seriously. Um, well, we've taken a little bit of a different approach at the IAC. Um, I, I work with um, artist services and community services at the IAC, but we also serve arts organizations and non-arts organizations that do art things. Um, we're trying to make sure that inclusion is baked into our programs that aren't obviously about diversity. Um, and for us, this has required a cycle of designing, doing, and listening. And um, a couple things I wanna just hit right away is that to do to engage new and diverse audiences you don't have to start a new program and you don't it's not about like marketing on TikTok. it's not about casting your net wider or diffusing what you're doing well it's not about watering things down it's about for us it's been about inclusion and prioritizing I inclusion sorry inclusion is about prioritizing and about slowing down um one example is uh on ramp, which is a program of ours. It is, I'm gonna just go ahead and share my screen. It is a creative entrepreneur accelerator. Um, ask any artist what they need um, and they will get to any business help pretty quickly. It's up there in the top few. Am I right? Artists out there, let me see you holler. <laughs> when, when we first started talking about what a program like this could look like, um, our partner and curriculum instructor told us that students are most successful when there are many different perspectives in the room because they'll learn from each other's experiences. So that made sense to us. And we decided that the cohort of 35, this is our first cohort, uh, individuals would have as many perspectives as possible in the state, uh, where they lived, their gender identity, those things on my post-it note that I kind of hit at the, in the beginning, um, their age, their race and ethnicity, their physical and mental ability, and their creative discipline. This was very different than normal from us and a little bit uncomfortable at first to ask some of these questions. Um, who's asking age out there? I don't know, that was the first time we'd done that. But we realized that the first step was asking, measuring um, the type of diversity that you wanna see increase. We have to know first. Does, that, does anybody else ask questions from their current audience? Are you, are you surveying? Are you checking out your demographics? Ask about who they are. What kinds of things are you asking about? And do you have any advice for folks who are not sure how to start that? Throw it in the chat box. I wanna hear your thoughts. Are you asking questions of who, who your current audience even is? So once we had this program op up and running, we did so much outreach. <laughs> this was for everyone in the state. And we focus grouped the communications. We tried to figure out the best wording for things to make sure it felt inclusive and hit all of the possibilities. Um, we looked to be focus groups, the visual identity. I mean, I do grant opportunity events, I used to, and uh, send so many emails and communications and social media. We had ambassadors who were spreading this opportunity out to as many different corners of Indiana as possible, which is great. People knew about the opportunity and we got some, a pretty healthy, diverse group of applicants for the first year. Uh, but we also learned from some really compassionate colleagues of ours that they challenged us that um, sometimes outreach really isn't enough to get somebody into the room, right? Sometimes we have to change the shape of the actual door itself to get people into the room. 
it's, don't don't think too hard about that in real life. But if you imagine that like a certain type of person can enter through a doorway, then is the door like enough to fit every type of person in it, right? Um, and for us, that meant that we had to change the way that we selected the cohort of on-rampers. And so we just had decided already that we were gonna prioritize diversity. And this is good to remember that implicit bias is a biological response. You will naturally select the people that look like you and write applications like you. <laughs> so prioritizing diversity is meant to hack the, system, the evolutionary system. Um, yeah, that was an important reminder for myself that this wasn't gonna happen naturally. My own response was going to select people that looked like me. Um, and a very, we, we assembled a, a very diverse admissions committee so that people who actually looked through the applications couldn't just be people who look like me. We can't, we can't have a bunch of Annas on the committee. Um, they scored the applications for quality, um, but we also used their, their scores and the information about the applicant provided about their hometown, their discipline, their race, their age, all of those things we just talked about. And we assembled a cohort with commitment and quality and a really rich collection of perspectives. And this, this program, we, we don't call it a diverse, it's not a diversity program, but inclusion is baked in. And our communication strategy, we never used any, we don't use anything like that. It's not, it's not the point of it, but it is a very, a very important value of the program that contributes to its success. So, you know, the photos we used, uh, the communication strategy was just to tell stories of people who are in it. And that inclusion was natural because the people who are in the group represented the fullness of diversity in Indiana. And of course, you know, when you see someone who thinks and talks and acts like you, you know that you're gonna belong there. So to be able to represent the, the most experiences in the room, you know, is important. Um, another really pragmatic thing we discovered was that, um, you know, in the same vein, we became really cognizant of the fact that the staff and leadership of the program, so both the instructor of the course, that's part of OnRamp, and myself, who is kind of just like running around all weekend, helping people do what they need to do, uh, or two white, walking, youngish, Midwestern, English speaking women. And so we created a new role that could share the power and keep widening that door, right? Um, which is our on ramp co host. So this is a contracted partner and an, an equal leader in this kind of staff team that runs the program. Um, that person will always be an on-ramp alumni, alumnus, uh, or alumna, and will have different life experience than me or Elaine. That's very important. That person helps with outreach. They help select the cohort. They're an important coach when they're in person during the uh, accelerator process, and they're an ally to those other creatives in there. Uh, we also feel like it's really important. We want to build a close relationship with that person. We want to share as much power as possible if that looks good on their resume or if giving them um, opportunities to speak to the group or develop leadership or coach in whatever way, that's um, important to let that be an experience building opportunity. Um, and we want to build our bench deeper of people who are different than us as a staff um, to be able to someday maybe see them brought on, on the team if that's what is the right opportunity. Um, really trying to build our relationships and professional experiences with people who are different than us. Um, so the other thing that's been really important with this co-host role is that um, they do trust us to, uh, to share, to call things out when they see something that could be a barrier for any community, for any individual. So for example, um, my co-host for On Ramp 2021, his name is Chris Mack. He's a musician from Muncie. Um, he's black and he is very connected to the black community in Muncie. And he helped us understand that one of the barriers to On Ramp for other black artists could be that black entrepreneurs have historically been denied business financing and professional development. <laughs> so even the way that we kind of described the program was like, ah, is this for me? Because for generations, I've been, not been able to access these kinds of resources before. So that was a blind spot for us. I don't know what to do with that information yet, but that's the kind of um, 
in intentional inclusion and not only, you know, Chris is in the door and there are, it's a quite racially diverse program, but there are other nuances that are important for, the, for us to fully connect with and serve artists well in Indiana, all artists well in Indiana. Uh, we measured the results of this program. I kind of showed you on the screen briefly. Um, their business skills shot through the roof, right? But um, they actually recognize and call out on their own that one of the things that made the experience really valuable is that they're different from each other. And they know that makes them stronger. Um, if you go back to this page, there are quotes on here. Um, they know that regardless of your background or where you are in your career, you realize you are an entire group of strangers that share similar fears, insecurities, questions, and dreams, and you become a great source of empowerment for one another. That's a quote from an alumna of OnRamp. Um, I've also seen you know, them collaborate with each other. They're using each other's strengths and skills. I've seen three generations of single mothers from one cohort mentoring each other. I think that's beautiful. Um, I've seen one artist teach another one how to drive. These differences make them stronger. Um, this program is, is also changing the Indian Arts Commission. Uh, we have built um, genuine, mutually beneficial connections with more artists than ever. And of course, they're different artists than ever because of that inclusion. And they know they're valued. They say that back to us. That feels like a really, that feels like a, a blessing. That's, that's a blessing. We are very grateful to have that trust. We know what weight that carries, that they know they're valued. And so they do come to us with ideas and with their own challenges and just to talk. Um, so we're able to better serve creatives um, by building that relationship up. We've only done two cohorts of this so far. That's 70 people so far. Um, but that, and that's very small in comparison to the 6 million Hoosiers we serve. But starting small, and comparatively, has had incredible um, impact on us. So like I said, this is a repeating cycle. It's design, listen, design, listen, right? And that, that first version of an inclusive program, or maybe even your fifth version of that program, is not going to be perfect. Um, but building up those relationships has been really critical. Like you heard Paige and Palermo, the friends. Um, but that prioritization at the very beginning catalyzed diverse participation in every other year in the future because uh, folks see themselves, they see their people, you know, whatever that means, um, in a program, then they know they belong in it. Um, that's important from the, from the bottom floor that diversity is prioritized, whatever you want to see happen. Um, and then I'll just really quickly share Another similar story, I mentioned earlier that inclusion isn't necessarily about casting your net wider or about starting a new program, but about slowing down. And um, we're about to launch a new program, a new partnership that has happened as a result of a lot of porch, porch sitting during COVID. Um, I, this started way back this started way back maybe a year ago when I just needed to make a video from one of our grant programs and we wanted to see some racial diversity represented in it. So, I mean, this was pretty lazy. I just looked back over our list of grantees who were not white and reached out to um, a writer who's here in Indianapolis named Maurice Broadus. Um, he agreed to do the video with us. It wasn't a deep collaboration. We didn't really have a strong relationship beforehand. We definitely learned more about each other's work, but this was really just a one-time thing. But then we both moved into the same neighborhood and we started running into each other. This was like, this was like the beginning of COVID. Um, we were all, everybody was always at home all the time and needing to get out. So we kept seeing each other on each other's porches. We live about a block away. And so then we would just have a weekly porch meeting because it was a pandemic and we needed some human interaction. But these were not purposeful meetings. This was just hanging out on the porch. Um, and usually we just brought our laptops and were working in the same space, but um, we usually just ended up like gossiping or talking about comic books. So this was not about building new networks. It was not about engaging diverse audiences, not at all. 
but of course it, it was, right? How is it, like, how do you get to know new people? Seriously, will you put that in the chat box? How do you slow down your life enough to spend time with somebody new? For me, it was just sitting on the porch and being okay with maybe being slightly less productive that day in my job, but getting to talk to Maurice about the Watchmen. How do you get to know new artists or new arts leaders? Do you, do you have room in your life to slow down and build those relationships? Would love to see some examples in the chat box. And I love that you say that, um, Anna. I think one of the things is if you're an organizational leader, oh, is that to support your staff and taking the time to do, develop those relationships. That this is important, you know, to do that. We don't have a lot of time left. We have a few minutes. And I think Palermo, you wanted to say something. Was there something you wanted to say and you didn't get the opportunity to? Um, yeah, I think it's just uh, um, emphasizing that everyone has value. And, you know, you uh, once you start to get to know people, you, you find those treasures on each person. You know, I, over the years, I found that, you know, people were, um, poets and their and their own countries and you know some some uh, you know like from mexico or, or burma um you know excellent um, um musicians writers uh, it's just incredible to find all of this but it was taking the time to to get to know as uh, anna mentioned to uh, get to know them and, and really listen and and uh, have that um uh, that education that you know we really need to have with people and and it's 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 very powerful once you you have that because then you're you will be thinking about well yeah this person is you know is a refugee but that doesn't mean anything that means that you know to me now i i see a a brother or sister someone that has talent and can contribute to my community and you know some are um, a lot of the immigrants and refugees are very entrepreneurial and they are really you know if you start seeing around your communities they are popping out their own businesses and uh, even though they have limited english skills they're still doing it and it's part of their life so um incorporating the arts you know it's it's also part of the our uh, sensitivity in in our own countries as well so it just tapping into those uh, uh, you know, uh, skills and, and fun things that you can have with, with people. And then once you start seeing those, then you will, you know, benefit and, and, and the benefit in your benefit in your community, your town and, and, and the value of them is just going to increase. And they're going to see they, this is a place they want to belong. They, they want their kids to grow and thrive. And I think that's what we have been doing here uh, successfully in Fort Wayne. Thank you for that, Palermo. Um, Y'all, I did put a, a link in the chat box and it's to some resources for you. Um, some of my favorite resources, The Art of Relevance by uh, Nina Simon is absolutely fantastic. Very easy read, very inspiring. Equity-Centered Community Design, a field guide that was done by uh, Creative Reaction Lab is a great publication. And I'm super inspired just by looking at the entries in the chat box of the things that you guys are really doing um, is really exciting and inspiring. And somebody did note, you know, always remember to appreciate those diverse volunteers and not appropriate those programs and just take it over. It's important to, to not do that. And we've, and we've seen that happen, certainly. Um, and that's an important reminder. It is about mutual benefit. It's not all about you. It's all about sharing who it's all about. And that's what makes it relevant. And that's what makes it meaningful. And that's what makes a great institution. Um, so that's just some of the things that I wanted to make sure that you guys had some uh, resources available to you um, so that when you are ready to do this, um, you can start thinking in that direction. And, and thank you, Anna, totally for bringing up about the three pound rate. So don't feel like, oh my gosh, I have to do all of this. No, start out small and, and slow and steady 
uh, really does win the race. And it sounds like a good place to start is in your own hometown. What are the resources? What are the resources and the assets that already exist? Like Anna said, there's a lot of brilliant artists out there. It could be an amazing quilter, a basket weaver, a sign painter, um, or what kind of groups um, have you not met that you want to be, have them be a part of your world, be a part of theirs. Um, so and you will um, find yourself like screwing up, but that's normal and everybody gets it. And it's important to just move forward and go on, iterate, iterate, iterate. And that's what Anna was talking about. And Anna is magic. She had created such a magical program because she is so empathetic and has learned uh, to listen so well. Um, and the on-ramp program is really a treasure to really hear what people say. Diversity is important, but in watching a diverse people come together, diverse disciplines, diverse backgrounds, urban, rural, racially diverse, age diversity. I have never seen so, anything so powerful in my entire life. It was incredible. And these people are so close still to this day. And, and you don't see that from a three-day program or even a three-day conference very often, where they're even creating exhibitions themselves. Um, so as you go forward in this work, I'm proud of you. Good for you. Um, it's a great direction. Just you'll have awesome relationships like me and Palermo. We still hang out. We're good friends. Just love you to death. Um, and you can obviously enjoy some different foods. <laughs> Clearly, that's a priority in this group, too. I think that you're hitting on something really important is that like we take this really seriously. This is important work and we're trying to like get consultants in it and like get the perfect formula. But what we've been talking about today is more about making friends and then letting that like bleed into our professional lives and asking people how or watch observing how our people we care about are interacting or not with the work that we do. Right. And that's that is simplifies it for me. I think it might complicate it for other people. But yeah, no. Great. Um, and so I put in that, that document again, it's just a Google Doc that you guys can open up. And there's three primary resources on there, um, that book, um, the field guide, and then a website um, that I think, and goodness knows, there's a plethora of stuff. So I just thought, I'll limit it to three, um, because they're my super favorites. Um, and I figured if I love them, surely you would love them, right? Which is very self-centered, of course. Oh, it's Kirk. Thank you. Yes, duck pin bowling is a great way to get to know others. We <laughs> homecoming when we didn't have it in a pandemic. We hosted duck pin bowling. It is super fun. <laughs> Highly recommend. Uh, well, all. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Palermo. Um, go forward, have fun, meet new people, make more meaning, be more relevant, and enjoy the process. Um, and when you screw up, you can tell us about it. We love to hear those kind of stories, truly, because we'll share them with others, not with your name attached. But it's really important to learn. It's learning from experience and experience matters. So thank you all and have a great rest of your homecoming. Thank you.